it's also good to kind of like be back to the headquarters where it all started so. okay we're recording now um welcome everyone uh this is the bi-weekly meeting of the umbc cyber defense lab today it's our honor to have a guest speaker mario satsetsig who's now coming from the Cayman Islands, working for the XX network. Um, those of you at UMBC may recall that a few years ago, he spent a year in the cyber defense lab at UMBC, finishing up his um, master's thesis. And there we established a collaboration with David Sham, which led to his work on XX. Today, uh, Mario is gonna be talking about a new result he has um, joint work with um, David Chom on embedding a backup uh, key in uh, crypto wallets um, so that if you lose the wallet, uh, you still have a chance to recover. So um, Mario. Perfect. Thanks everyone for joining. So today we're going to be talking what we call as a pun name, what's up my sleeve. What's in this case stands for the Winternet's one time signature scheme and that's a hash based scheme the we're going to present now like what we this new construction that allows us to have uh we call it a quantum secure fallback just because of the context of the xx network but this is you will see that this is very generic and allows people to plug and play any anything that they want cryptography wise so let's just go over the team that was involved in this project. So first we have David Chum, who we, many of you in the call probably know, creator of Digital Cash, Anonymous Internet Communications. Then we have Mario Laranjeira, who we met in uh, at Crypto in 2018. Mario is usually the one that gives this talk, so that's why his name is in bold. Uh, and then you have myself on the right side, uh, now working at the XX Network. So the problem for this is basically, so if your secret key, you have a cryptocurrency wallet and that secret key becomes public, how can you prove that you own that wallet, All right? Because effectively blockchains use the secret, a signature to distinguish the true owner of a wallet. But what if that key is compromised? Then the adversary and the real owner, they're completely indistinguishable, right? So what happens? And another way to look at this project is, okay, what if a quantum computer appears and they break the, what's called the elliptic curve discrete log problem. So they effectively steal your key. They're also indistinguishable from yourself. So can we do something that allows you as a true owner of that wallet to prove that you actually own that, that key? Uh, and just for context, so for people to, to know like how, why this is, uh, Ethereum, as over 210 million different wallets. So you're looking at over two to the 27 wallets total. Bitcoin has over 40 million distinct wallet addresses and MetaMask has over 21 million daily users. So if a massive hack occurs at scale and whether that's a vulnerability in a wallet or potentially MetaMask, or this is something that we've been seeing more recently, how can a user address this, this key compromise? So there's no real solution right now out in the wild. And there's a couple of takes that people can have here. So uh, you could maybe stop the network uh, via social consensus. Uh, and social consensus just means that people like on Discord talk with each other and they kind of agree to put a halt on the network and then KYC users and wallets. This is not really ideal because a lot of the movement, like the ethos of the space kind of doesn't want people to reveal their own identities and it's like reveal a lot of the information with their wallets and it kind of goes also against the notion of the blockchain doesn't stop right you shouldn't be able to stop a blockchain and unfortunately what we've seen out there in the wild is that many of these networks they have kind of like one main node that stops the whole network and so just like they could address issues like this uh, then you can use cryptography to actually prove that you own a compromised secret key. And this is the path we took for, for this project. Alternatively, there's also a couple of proposals out there in the, in, like in the, in the academia that it would allow you to, you could trigger a governance dispute resolution where you can claim there was a hack, uh, submit proof. Like this is more relevant for bridges. Sometimes it, like if there's a bridge connecting two blockchains and 600 million disappear, you can kind of prove that that was not really an intentional play because the bridge is supposed to hold the funds there. So that, that's kind of like an unusual movement. 
and you could kind of trigger the disputes from there or you could do nothing often this is the approach taken in the blockchain space where you just take the hit it's kind of like oh code is law unfortunately this happened and you don't do, just don't do anything we think we can contribute to something big here just by using cryptography to, to prove that you actually own a key so our solution is what we call sleeve uh, and it's basically just like if all the keys are lost then you have something up your sleeve <clears throat> Let's just go over very quickly about like how uh, traditional elliptic curve cryptography and the wallets work. So roughly speaking, you have, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but on the left side, you have a little box where it's like the elliptic curve uh, secret key. We just call it A for uh, Alice. And then you can apply a trap door. So you multiply that times the generator of the specific elliptic curve, and then you get the public key. So that's pretty straightforward. So now we want to hide a key in this process. So is there a way we can build with this as a building block? Cause we don't want to change this. This is how all the wallets work. So given this, can we add something? <clears throat> so this work actually started in 2021 and the, you can see in the citation there. So the notion here is we have now a post quantum secret key. From there, we apply also a one way uh, process, a trap floor function, and we get a public key and we can hash that and from there, we have an elliptic curve secret key. So this is this would be a pretty straightforward solution. Turns out we actually want it this way, and I'll, I'll show you now why. Uh, so why don't we just do this? And the reason is that we want to expose that value. So we want users to show, <clears throat> my name is Mario, I own a wallet, but I also want to let people know that in case something happens, I'm gonna use this specific key to prove that I own that wallet. And you can see from this diagram here, so if we can, if we expose that value, then you can generate the whole wallet and we don't want that. So uh, what we just did is we keep a little key value private and we, we use a key hash function to generate the rest of the wallet. We then improved on this fundamental result in uh, 2022, where we uh, basically, we, we changed the hash function to a tweakable hash function and not to get into like, a lot of boring details, but the reason we did this is because it's we strict the the, the security game now moves just to a second collision uh, second pre image resistance. So let's just zoom in on what this looks like. So we have <clears throat> don't be scared by the bottom part. That's just how you generate a hash based uh, secret key. But just very abstractly think you have one key on the top and then one key on the bottom. Uh, the, the, the way hash based signatures work is that you need to generate a lot of ladders for each of the bytes that you're signing. And this is just very, it's a very concrete implementation for the XX network. So this is how it works for our specific blockchain, but you could just change it to whatever you want in, in the bottom. Uh, so given this construction, now we have a way for Alice to prove that a specific ECDSA private key belongs to her. And the reason is because even if the secret key of the wallet gets compromised, the adversary cannot invert that hash function. So therefore they can't produce any proof with what's up on the left side, the fallback side. And what this allows is that Alice can now have an ECDSA wallet, a regular cryptocurrency wallet connected to the internet, and she can be a bit more careless uh, with that wallet. So she can kind of just like still do her daily operation, do like all of that stuff that can be kind of like what's called a hot wallet connected to the internet, but she can use this fallback, uh, this fallback, watch out, it has to be kept in cold storage. So never really expose this to any adversary, uh, write it in pen and paper. In the end, I'll show how we implement the whole thing to be retro compatible, but uh, that's kind of like the constraint we have here. So the system is very practical. The only constraint is keep that fallback key secure and hidden. Uh, for use cases, what we found is that this is very helpful in uh, wallet hacks. So when the actual wallet software is compromised, uh, a lot of people use their hot wallets. They just put the 12 word mnemonic and that software sometimes can become compromised either by a dependency or something. And then that key gets completely extracted. The moment that key gets extracted, it's game over because you can't really distinguish if, if that key actually belongs to Mario or if it's already like, if it actually always belongs to someone else. It's also very useful for quantum ready ERC20s. So if you're launching 
uh, a token and you want to use the traditional ERC20 standard and stick to the ECDSA part, you can use the exact same standard, but just add this like key generation component in uh, the, whenever you generate a key for that for the, those tokens. And then you're already quantum ready. So even if a quantum computer appears, you can always prove that you are owner of a specific token. Also very relevant for bridges and DeFi hacks. So you can force uh, bridge transactions to f require the use of an extra key. So every transaction that say is over 200 million, that can be considered a bit like of a red flag. So just uh, make sure that you need that fallback key to sign that type of like heavy hitter transaction. And then the adversary should not be able to, to steal your keys. Uh, it's very useful for quantum rollovers. So imagine you have uh, something happens, we need to standardize new quantum uh, new quantum cryptography. Uh, it's a, it's very messy right now as is for blockchains to roll over to new types of cryptography. This way we have, <clears throat> the way our structure works, it's that it's effectively a binding commitment to a key pair. So you as a user, you can prove that your fallback key can effectively open a commitment to the key that you use in your daily life. And it's also a blockchain fail safe. So you can always have this as a safety measure in a smart contract or whatever may make sense. It is, this construction is very modular. Uh, you can use literally any type of cryptography. You can replace the part in the top. You can replace a part in the, like the, the fallback. The main assumption is hash functions and they're here to stay because Every signature scheme uses hash functions anyway, so like they, they, we're not going to go go away from that. Uh, that's the main assumption that we use for this. Then you can literally plug and play every every type of thing. And like a, a fun fun fact is that this week I coded this. This is one of the things we're, we're submitting a new a new uh, pull request, uh, such that you can generate primes from a fallback key. So you can go from a fallback key, generate two primes, and then generate an RSA key pair. Uh, so this is how modular it is. You can literally use this for, for anything. It's ZK friendly. So you can kind of choose the hash function that you use. You can use like specific, specific hash functions, make sure they're quantum resistant. But overall, we found that the schemes, the scheme is very practical to prove this statement. Uh, even with uh, just using regular SHA-256 or SHA-3, uh, the circuit is not that big. So there's, there's not a lot of constraints. It's it's very it's a very practical practical scheme, and it's backwards compatible. So any wallet, uh, any user, any person in this call could literally do this tomorrow. So they could be like, you know what? I want to make sure that my Bitcoin wallet or my Ethereum wallet is safe. Let me just like rekey. You generate a new key, send your money, and now you're like set. So you can integrate any signature scheme as a fallback. You can prove the statement. You prove in zero knowledge is I have. Uh, I'm highlighting post quantum here just for for the context, but you can you could change that. I have I am the owner of a post quantum public key that when I hash with a secret value results in the CDSA key for this specific wallet. So th this is very feasible, and it's backwards compatible. So it's orthogonal to whatever like software that the blockchain is running. So now that's kind of like the high level look. Uh, should be pretty clear. I can take a break here just for questions. If there's like any, I'm going to go into like a big more mathematical formal analysis of, of things. If, 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 if not, I can just leave questions to, to the end. Uh, I have a question, Mario. All right. And let's hit me. So whenever we're looking at sort of um, these hash based systems, especially systems that seem like they're going to be around for a long time, I have to wonder what is the plan, for instance, if the hash function you're using breaks at some point during the life cycle of your system? We saw this, for example, with SHA-1, right? Yeah. yeah. I just don't know how these large systems, I, I don't know if they have like explicit plans to go back and sort of remediate that kind of problem. I'm curious to see if you've thought, if you have any so thoughts about this. One problem. of the, we, for us, it's not a concern, but it was at first in the first proposal, but it all, it's not anymore now because what we found so that we changed it to use a tweakable hash function so that we change the, the you breaking a wallet requires you breaking second pre-image. 
and uh, to my knowledge as like right now no one was able, able to break a second pre-image not even for md5 and md5 has been completely destroyed since <laughs> since we're pretty much like way before we went to college um so for us right now that's that's the situation for blockchains in general i don't think that people are really prepared uh for that type of scenario uh usually the breaks are also more on the the collision resistance side of things uh so it's more like you trying to submit two contracts that hash to one same uh digest value that would probably be a bit chaotic for a a, a social layer to handle but it, it so i don't think people are prepared for that but that's we should be good uh, sleeve wise if that makes sense that's really cool thanks So I think we can now dive into the the more math, like formal side of things. Hold on, Mario. I think there's a so, question in the chat. Go for it. There's a question oh, in I, the I chat. Can't, I can't really see. Can you read that question out loud? I, yeah, so I'm Jack Cooper asks, could you say more about the limit mechanism you mentioned, this time delay between a contract execution and proving ownership? Oh, okay. Uh, that would potentially be a system parameter. So you as a, a, a protocol designer would choose what time you, you, you would need for that. Often what they have in the literature is you send one transaction today and you send the fallback like double proof the next day, just to give it like a cool down period. Uh, but you could just have it be instant. So you can just be like, you know what? I'm submitting to the two transactions right now. Uh, they usually wait for that cooldown period just to make sure that uh, the hacker is not doing it all at once. So you could kind of just like see what's going on. Almost all, uh, like if you, if you know a bit about rollups, almost like an optimistic rollup type of thing, you can just kind of see you have some time window to settle uh, what's going on. So that that's usually the the trade off. But the way we envision it, and that's what we're, the, the, what we're doing now, is we have a smart contract. And you can, on a regular day, just use your CDSA wallet for whatever. But if it's like a very sensitive operation, you submit the, a specific transaction to the smart contract. And you can just touching on NFTs. If you have an NFT worth like a hundred grand, you may want to force it such that that NFT can only be transferred if you sign with that fallback key. So like if you by accident sign something on MetaMask, it's okay because that NFT is not going to leave your wallet anyway. And that was a big thing we saw. A lot of the exploits that were happening in the open sea where, where people were like misled into clicking on signing a transaction on MetaMask and they, they would just steal all of their their assets basically. And I hope that answers the question, Jeff. Um so looking at the more formal side of things, <clears throat> a regular signature scheme is pretty straightforward. You generate the key. So here, the notation we use is when you generate a key pair, you have a verification key, often known as public key, and you have a secret key just to sign messages. Uh, then you sign messages. To sign, you receive a message and the secret key. Now that puts a signature. We, I usually use Sigma, and I think the space in general uses Sigma just because it starts with Sig as well. Uh, so signature. And then to verify, you should be able to verify that a message is correctly signed if you have a message, a verification key, and the signature. And then that outputs either zero or one. So what we had here, uh, so with sleeve, we kind of change the, the the game a bit. So we re now generate an extra key, what we call uh, BK for a backup key. And now we add uh, an algorithm called proof. So you're able to prove given a backup key and the challenge. You provide the proof and then you should also be able to verify that the proof is correct so the verified proof you receive both verification key secret key proof and challenge so you don't even need anything else other than what's already on chain and you can prove this is that property i was mentioning you can prove that it's a binding commitment effectively to, to the, the keys that are on chain um so regularly see the sa wallet has a verification key and a secret key and now we have this notion of a fallback so it's just an extra signature scheme uh, signature scheme to be used uh and from there you can generate a proof of ownership so like that, that backup key can be used to show a proof of ownership one interesting property we have here is this is almost twofold so you can prove 
just by opening the commitment that there that that you use the sleeve wallet so you can prove that the key is generated in a way that e there is a key that owns that is a fallback to a main wallet <clears throat> or you can actually sign using that key so these are two different statements they, they, they may sound very similar but they are fundamentally different because one act, one user actually proves that they are the owners of the backup key the other one can be uh, just a quantum computer breaks the elliptic curve discrete log and you can just say guys it's okay let's just roll over and i'm going to roll over to this backup key and then you can just use that in the future versus the other one already implies that key usage in that specific point in time uh i don't really want to like go too deep into this uh slide because it, it was just for the for paper purposes but what this says is basically uh that the adversary should not be able to generate uh a proof such that it passes verified proof so it should be negligible if an adversary is given access to the secret key and the public key so if they actually break the whole cryptocurrency wallet that you own they should not be able to prove ownership of uh, a wallet and this is kind of like more what it would look like so here a user generates the three keys sends those two this is how we prove the security using the, the security game so the security game here is you generate the three keys you send the your entire cryptocurrency wallet to the adversary the adversary then has to generate uh, malicious uh, proof and challenge that passes that very high proof and this here this and this is the part where that relies on a uh, second pre-image and one of the one of the and i'll take this even one one step further <clears throat> one of the big issues that we have is this i think this was the first time i ever saw this happen in the wild the we we learned this in callers like the notion of multi-target attacks so like it's easier for an adversary to find a collision if there's a, already like a big uh, span of values out there so it's it, it just saves them a lot of work and we notice that this is you're looking at over 28 bits of reduction in security if if you account for multi-target attacks <clears throat> so say if you think it's secure now it's, it's often it's very popular to go around 90 uh, uh like have a, a security of 90 bits if you don't account if you don't take into account multi-target attacks you subtract it's 90 mi minus 28 if you, you subtract that that is no not really a secure system in the wild it, sh it shouldn't be bitcoin mining per year does way more than that and it's just because you forgot to take into account that there's a lot of wallets in the wild and it, it, it's very substantial the way we do it with a tweakable hash function there there are no multi-target attacks because of the way that the stuff is prefixed and and suffixed in the in the, the hash digest so that this is pretty powerful this is just how you generate the proof so the, you receive a challenge and the backup key a challenge is just a fallback message it could literally be just a, a previously agreed statement like uh, a hash of all zeros for example it would just prove that you are the true owner of that backup backup key uh the rest of the box is like specific details for how you generate uh watts plus signature i don't think it makes a lot of sense to go into that potentially a bit scary math there <laughs> and then to verify a signature is also it's also the same this is just a very it's a typical so <clears throat> proof and verify proof are literally the same as sign and verify for the, another signature scheme you're you're basically just signing with the fallback keys the only thing that we're adding is the step of matching the hashes so that proof that the fallback key and the little uh, secret that piece of text string that you use, they need to hash to one value. So that, that's the only thing we're adding. So proof and verify proof are literally sign and verify traditional digital signatures. And then we just add a hash step on top of that. So for security analysis, this was quite a roller coaster because we proved uh, the entire scheme is proven from uh, what kdfs to use to generate the fallback key so, so all the bounds that we have are tight uh, it's we know exactly at the bit level the security of every single piece of the of the construction 
this is the security proof is in the random oracle model purely for the reason that we need to assume that that hash function generates a randomly distributed uh, a secret key for the wallet we prove the security of the fallback and then we use a formal methods analysis on just to see if we're missing something here so i don't think it makes a lot of sense to go into the actual nitty bitty proofs of how it maps to the cdsa <clears throat> uh if anyone is interested i can share on the chat uh the two papers we have on this this is why like it's very detailed all the proofs are there uh i think we can just keep it more more concrete for the purposes of the talk but it's basically that the the the, the hash and uh, a random generation on your computer should be uh, indistinguishable. Both should be random. Security of the fallback. So here, the the adversary can either uh, break sec second preimage or break the um, the unforgeability of the, of the signature scheme. In this case, is what's plus. This is exactly what allows us to get the tight proof of security <clears throat> so the security here is literally the minimum of either breaking second pre-image which is usually the hash size so you can choose whatever hash size you want or whatever security proof you have for the fallback signature scheme this is this is pretty neat because you can very modularly analyze the security of the whole construction so you know if you're using a signature scheme that gives you 100 bits of security or a hash that gives you 128 bits, you will know exactly the security of the fallback. You know it's your weakest point, and we can have that tight. We did a formal methods analysis using Verifpal, and there's a couple of fundamental results here that were pretty interesting. We did this just to make sure that it matched our, our mathematical proofs. Uh, the good news is that it did, but we found out that a lot of the stuff is not really easy to module in this tool. So, for example, the Watts Plus requires a lot of iterative hashing, so you need to do a lot of hashing throughout a lot of different chains. You're looking at thousands of, of hashes. You can't really model that using these tools. So we had to kind of like find a work around that. And they also have this chaining function that uses the XOR. Uh, operation and that's not available on very well and many of the other tools out there. So what we did is we just modeled a regular ECDSA and the Lamport signature fallback. So Lamport signature, instead of having like a big, big lather, like what's plus, you just hash a lot of individual bits and that's easier to model like actually hard code uh, in software. So we just did it for a small fallback, but it's it's easily extendable. And the conclusion for this is that sleeve is secure as long as the, the 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 scheme has the appropriate parameters. So all of the stuff that you use needs to be instantiated properly. We implemented this, so this is actually production ready and is being used by a lot of people. So this is it's a pretty interesting situation there. So it's also audited. So this is fully audited and open source. So if anyone is curious, you can look at github.com xxlabs slash sleeve. There you will find the security audit, the entire code for this. The This is also deployed. So the XX network is already using this. You can generate the key. I'll show a screenshot of what that looks like, uh, but you can easily go on xx.network. I think there's a wallet tab there and you will be able to see how it works. It is compatible with existing crypto wallets. And this was a big thing we had to focus on because we can't really force hundreds of millions of people to adopt a new standard. So we had to go with what they are using and all the cryptography that has, has, is already deployed out there and kind of adjust ourselves around that while giving the best, best security to people. So what this means is that you can use uh, BEEP39 and that's the... Um, that's the mnemonics, uh, the traditionally well-known mnemonics for cryptocurrency wallets. So for benchmarks, uh, we found out that the key generation takes uh, almost two seconds. Uh, sorry, 1.81 milliseconds. And that's pretty ne negligible for users. So you as a user, if you're thinking, oh, how practical is this? It is very practical. It's, it's under two milliseconds. So you shouldn't even really feel the difference. 
this is just very relevant if you say you are an exchange and you're generating millions under the million of keys it will take you a couple of extra seconds potentially minutes uh, and just for contrast like ecdsa would take you 0 0.059 milliseconds uh, this is single threaded though so we could potentially improve on these values if we calculate the hash ladders in parallel this is the whole like key generation process so for the wallet app, I'm going to show you now a couple of screenshots of what is out there. We have over 4,000 users uh, that are using this, this construction. And we tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. So you were on step three here, but basically, thank you, Keith. Keith just posted the, <clears throat> the link for the wallet. Uh, first, it has the instructions. It will show you what to do. Number two is the passphrase in case you want to encrypt the, the key yourself. I skipped those two because usually they're not very widely used. Uh, so what the wallet gives, it gives you a quantum secure recovery. So you should just do this on a safe computer, safe machine that's not connected to the internet. Get these 24 words, write them down. This is your fallback key. Now you can just store it uh, however you like, whether that's a vault, your own house, under the mattress, whatever you think makes more sense to you. This is your quantum secure key. And then you just move on to the standard phrase. This is the same thing. You also have 24 words, but now this wallet here that you get, you can use, it's your daily uh, cryptocurrency wallet. So you can use this for wherever you want now. Just move on with your life. At your... <clears throat> this is compatible with any wallet out there. Like any wallet would accept these and you generate the key. And then here we just have like an extra step where we just ask users to check if the, if, if they actually wrote this somewhere, they stored it. So for four full papers, we have uh, What's Up My Sleeve that was published at ACMS in 2021. And then we have what, the tweakable sleeve where we, we improve the, uh, on the construction with more proofs and uh, tweakable hash functions. And that was, we presented that last year at Marvel. And thank you. I think I can open for questions. Also, I have a question, you? Mario. Oh, sorry. Uh, go for it. Go for it. Sorry. I was going to ask what happens if the fallback key is leaked? Then it's game over. <laughs> Could there be any way to bind the, the fallback key to some identity? It could. That's a very interesting, it's a very interesting take. Yeah. You could use almost like to deterministically generate from a special ID that you have right. or a credential. You would generate a fallback key, and then from there you could generate. Then um, even if the fallback key is leaked, you can say, "Okay, this is some hash of my, I don't know, exactly some number." Yeah, that that's very interesting. I, that never occurred to me or or us. So like that's we that should be sleep, we should talk more of sleep three. Absolutely, yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. What are your plans over the next year for this project? So right now, what we're trying to do is we already deployed. So the, the first low hanging fruit kind of like quote unquote is we are planning on submitting improvement proposals to different chains. So we found out that independently, a couple of Ethereum researchers a bit after we started proposed uh, it's along these lines but it's a bit different and they are trying to standardize that too and our construction already provides not only their assurances but much more and so we're trying to bring that out in, as improvement proposals for different chains because this is effectively for free it's just you're offloading computations to users you don't have to change anything at a chain level uh, even the wallets potentially would have to just be prepared to generate new like fallback key material, but you can kind of defer that to the future. Um, so that's one of the angles. The other thing we're doing is we're trying to get the zero knowledge component ready. So for you to prove in zero knowledge that you are the real owner of a specific key pair. 
I also try to do that using Starks because um, the ZK Starks are, are quantum secure. So it would make sense for a quantum secure fallback for you to prove in a quantum manner that, or a quantum secure manner, that you are the real owner of a wallet. <clears throat> we like, I struggled a bit with that, with uh, the current state of uh, Starkware and Cairo, but th that can be done. So that, that's something that can be done. So I would expect the, the, the improvement proposals to appear on uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, like many others that are happy to uh, open to suggestions, then get the zero knowledge part. And then once we have the zero knowledge part, we will compile that into contracts so that we can have actually have smart contracts in the wild for people to be able to interact with and then move funds accordingly. Hi, my name is Brendan Halliburton. I'm a sophomore computer science major. And I had another question about deployment. Could you talk more about like the timeline of deployment and like how long this is going to take to integrate? So for deployment, it would it will depend. Integration is a bit of a tricky question because software wise, it's very straightforward, but there has to be agreement regarding what fallbacks people want to use. So one of the big things that one of the big problems that comes from from it's not exclusively like this construction but the the quantum problem is wh what are people going to use as fallback right so like now nist is standardizing or has standardized the the post quantum signature schemes but there's always a bit of like suspicious and division in the space right some people push for lattice based cryptography other people push for hash based cryptography other people will push for isogeny so they everyone kind of has their own preference. And we will see the vision within the communities itself. So maybe half of the Bitcoin people will want lattice base, other half will want hash base. Uh, so that that's kind of like the biggest stopper here for deployment, because other than that, all we need is you to have, you can code this yourself, like the spec is there. The, the, it, it, it shouldn't even be that hard because most of the functions are already available for the, the wallets. And then you just need to choose whatever code you want for the fallback. And most of that is already open sourced by the, the NIST competition as well. So technically speaking, it should, like theoretically shouldn't be that hard. Obviously there's always some caveats in the real world. Um, that would be kind of like the biggest adoption hurdle to overcome. But, other than that, this is non-interactive. So like non-interactive in the sense that you don't really need to be interacting with people or you just need to change your wallet address. So like you, you, you have money in your wallet, you create a new wallet and then send your money to the new wallet. And then that wallet is ready, quantum ready or future ready. It may be interesting also just to point out very quickly that you can also make it in a way where you have different keys already kind of hiding in the that, that's that's sleeve 2.5 one of the things we have since we have like different values coming into the hash it you can kind of just plug and play different different keys just in case so you can have like a hash key a lattice key and an isogeny key and then those three are the fallback but they also have other properties in the construction and then if you want to roll over you can always roll over to the one you can choose which one of those three If anyone is interested, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, if anyone is interested in collaborating, have any ideas, like what Farid mentioned, this, it's very interesting. We're very open to, this isn't, this has been going since 2021 and we're, we're it started <clears throat> very small. And now, uh, people like a couple of like big people on Twitter know about this. It's an interesting, it's an interesting problem, an interesting solution to, uh, as far as I know, this is the, the best out there and we're just trying to, we just want to improve it on a, on a weekly basis well thank you very much mario um i'd like to point out that um the annual uh, umbc research day will take place friday may 5th it'll be a hybrid format this year 
both online and in person. The in person section is in the ECS atrium and includes a free lunch. Um, it's open to the public. Um, we'll highlight the best research from this academic year from students and faculty. Uh, we'll be back in uh, two weeks for the next CDL talk. So th this concludes our session. Perfect. Thank you everyone for joining.